will stay on for us. Uh, it's 5.16, uh, and I'll call this meeting of the Economic Development Committee to order for Tuesday, February 1, 2022. Uh, we have a kind of a light agenda, it seems. Of course, you never know what's going to happen with this group. So, uh, First item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from our meeting of January 4. Do I have a motion to approve? I have from Rasmussen. Do I have a second? I have a second from Watson. Anybody find anything there to talk about? Seeing none, all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Thank you. Second item on the agenda is a presentation by Elizabeth Knight of Aplomb on the Wassum, Wassum campaign. Uh, do you want to just go ahead, Liz? Or yeah. Elizabeth and I got a Liz and I got Elizabeth now. That's <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Good seeing everybody tonight. So, um, Liz asked me just to come in and give a quick campaign summary of the latest and greatest Wassum project that we've been working on since September. So I'll do that very briefly. A lot of you here are familiar with the campaign. Um, nothing has necessarily changed with our goals. Um, uh, Liz brought me on in September just to kind of help bridge a little bit of a gap as she got, um, you know, introduced to her new department and just trying to figure out some of the bits and pieces. Um, so coming in in September, we uh, stuck with our same goal, really just position the city as an ideal place to live, work, raise a family, start or grow a business, or retire. Um, in this particular campaign, we really focused on using two different tactics. Again, the My Wassum Story features, which we produced two, and then really leveraging the social media channel that has been kind of foundational since the beginning of the campaign that started, you know, uh, I think we're going on three or four years now. So with that said, the two stories that we featured, hopefully everyone here had a chance to look at them. In October, we featured Ed Guillombardo from Westside Tasty Treat and his wife Marjorie. And then in December, we featured Ben Rye from Wasa Coated. So those were two feature stories. And then um, I'm going to transition to social first, and then we're going to come back to the website. Um, looking at those numbers there, you'll see... Um, our page followers are right around um, 30, just over 3,400 as of last week. We had some really nice bumps in organic engagement, which on Facebook is starting to get harder and harder to do. A lot of marketers will argue that Facebook is kind of becoming a pay-to-play place, and I was very, very pleased with some of the organic reach we were able to get with this campaign and leveraging the Wassum Facebook page, which tells us that the audience we have there is the right audience, so they're engaging with our content. Um, you know, sometimes pages and, and cities chase likes and followers, and you know, you might have 200,000 likes, but if no one is engaging with your content, it's it's very you know, it's not worth very much to you. So that that was um, very encouraging to me. So looking at um, Ben's story here that we promoted in early December when it was released. Sorry, I'm bouncing around. You can keep scrolling there you go um, we did decide to do a little bit of paid advertising with this campaign and when I say a little like really little uh, we, we spent a hundred dollars total uh, on Facebook advertising and it really was just to kind of expand our reach into some of those markets that we've targeted in the past specifically Milwaukee Madison Chicago and Minneapolis so we kind of stuck with that strategy so we spent a hundred dollars this was the paid post for Ben's story and you'll see in the bottom right corner there, those are the numbers that are uh, connected to that, that paid post, which we only spent $50 on, Ben. Um, we reached just over 8,500 people, and we had 820 total engagements. Of those total engagements, we had um, 88 link clicks over to the website. I'll get into website numbers in just a second. Um, then looking at Ed's paid social ad, which is next in the slides, same thing, 50 bucks. His story reached just under 4,000 people and had 313 engagements with 91 clicks over to the website. So those were the only two things we did that were paid. Everything else I'm gonna talk about is organic. So um, the next uh, post was another post that we did on ads and this one reached just over 4,500 people and had 589 engagements, which for organic is incredible. Um, same thing here with the TCT drop story, and that was one thing I wanted to point out. I started repurposing content from you know other other years that we've done this campaign, and it is still 
really engaging the audience on the page. So this is all organic, once again, reaching just over 4,700 people with 70, 775 engagements. Um, that's incredible for organic reach on Facebook, particularly when we're using this evergreen content that we've, we've, we've repurposed quite a bit already. So very encouraging numbers there. Um, just kind of flying through these. Kevin's story reached just uh, just shy of 3,400, had 606 engagements. Um, Hannah's story, which was one of the first stories we ever did in the campaign, I, this is probably three or four years old by now, that reached over, just over 2,000 people. So very encouraging number there is with organic reach. So the story, the message is getting out there. You know, we've, we've kind of positioned this campaign to not only use it as a recruitment tool and get new eyes on the city of Wausau and the good things that are happening here, but certainly there is... Um, our, our audience uh, primarily is WASA residents, WASA people who are in WASA, which is also encouraging because it just kind of, you know, for obvious, obvious reasons, um, underlines why WASA is special and why um, we want to invest in this community. So then if you scroll to the next one, we get into the website statistics a little bit. Very high level. If people want more detail, I, we can go into detail, but I kept it very high level for the purpose of this meeting. These were our top 10 page views. Again, this was just September 20th through January 20th, so a few weeks ago. Um, obviously, the Wassum Stories page, that's the landing page, is going to be the biggest, wassum.com. But then you can see Ben's story, Ed's story, Kevin's story, um, where those kind of ranked in terms of traffic. Total page views over that month, um, September to January, were just over 4,600, and unique page views were 3,600. So that's, those, that's the numbers of people being driven to the website. Yes. Oh, so engagements, what does that technically mean? Like, is when I'm talking about uh, social media, mm -hmm. an engagement is a link click, uh, um, a like, a uh, care, you know, one of those emojis, a comment, or a share. So they, they did some type of engagement with the post, more than just scrolling. Um, the audience, that reach number is people might just be scrolling. So they didn't necessarily stop and read the, the post word for word. If they engage with it, it means they actually click something. So it was the link. They hit like, they shared, something like that. Um, so again, or, you know, over those um, few months, we, we had 3,600 unique people hitting the website and engaging with the content. On that next slide, you'll see the locations. I know the um, committee is often interested in the locations of where people are coming from to look at and engage with this content. WASA, again, is the big one, um, which is just over 1,600. But you can see those cities that we targeted with our um, ads, Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, and then kind of down on the list there, Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis, all are in there. Um, I'm not sure what's going on in Virginia. It, we either have a huge fan or <laughs> um, someone's mom. I, I have no family in Virginia. It's not my family. So um, someone's a big fan of Wassa in Virginia. Um, and then the last slide that I just wanted to mention is just future opportunities. I like to just kind of plant a seed for as you look to the future. You have this library of stories. I know I've said this before. Continue to leverage and share it. You can certainly see organic reach. People are interested in that content. Um, anytime we put a story out there, whether it's a new story like Ed or Ben's or an old story, people seem to really, really uh, enjoy enjoy it. Um, continue producing. I would I would say continue producing those stories. We know there's a lot of stories out there to be produced in this city, so I would encourage you to continue that. Um, social media. Love it or hate it, that's where people are. Um, we certainly can ramp up with video, creating some reels, doing a little bit more engaging and dynamic content over and above what we did in just the last couple of months. And then um, considering a redesign of that wassum.com landing page where all these stories are, are put. If you really are looking at recruitment or retention efforts, uh, what, we, what we currently have is pretty static. There's not much you can do with it. So, you know, if there was a magic pile of money that fell from the sky and you were looking to spend it, that would be a great place to spend it because you could create, um, in order to capture, we have these people going to the website, but then not, you know, keep them there and kind of move them through the funnel of um, economic development would be very powerful because right now with the limitations of the site, we can't really do that very well. So I'll stop there. Anybody have questions? Well, um, you know, before I opened up to the committee uh, for comments and questions, um, and yeah, we're all about magic money falling from the sky. Yeah. Just, we do it all the time. So. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was really interested in the uh, social media um, results, and it just goes to show, uh, while there is that, that uh, pay-to-play element in Facebook, uh, and you can do that uh, pretty targetedly and, um, and, and pretty affordably and, and get 
very noticeable results. Mm -hmm. uh, but the organic side of it too, I think the more outreachy you are, the more engagey you are, the better you'll do mm -hmm. on that side of the of the coin as well. So I mean, later on tonight we're going to have a you know presentation about uh, mm -hmm. you know, proposed marketing campaign, uh, and. Um, I'll, I'll maybe hit that again when that comes up, but I think it's important information for us to keep in mind uh, that we have to be, uh, you know, active and dynamic and organic and uh, invest a few bucks here and there, especially when we have a, a, you know, something new to come out, a new yeah. a new story, a new video, something like that. Let's, let's let's promote it. You know, let's get something out there on it, create a little buzz. So, exactly. Uh, anyways, uh, I appreciate it, uh, committee. I saw some hands, Mr. Killian. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the information. I think it was really positive. We got the location data tonight. We had talked about that in prior uh, presentations and interactions. I was just wondering on, I have a, a few questions on that front. Might it be possible if the goal to is to kind of hit a non wasa uh, audience a little more, would it be possible to uh, bump up geo-targeting efforts uh, outside of WASA so that we kind of see the numbers uh, increase uh, outside of this geography here? That That's my first question there. And I'll just uh, say the second, based on your landing page comment, it would be really neat if there was was kind of a success metric or action, you know, uh, kind of a uh, uh, something we could use as a key performance indicator so that when you did the landing page optimization, uh, once we had that uh, success action defined, perhaps we could ultimately work out, you know, a cost per action or a target cost per action so the city would know, hey, if we're spending X amount, uh, we can uh, kind of anticipate we may get these results. So what do you think about those two uh, topics? The, I'll, I'll answer your second question first. With um, respect to that, absolutely. Uh, it, you know, if you, if you consider right now the, the static nature of the website, it's really hard to kind of measure ROI on some of these things. We can drive people to the website, but once they're there, we don't have we don't really have a funnel that we're moving them through. So that would absolutely be appropriate if you look to, you know, redesign that, rebuild that, re-leverage that content on, on, on a web platform. Um, I think that would be critical to, to start uh, really tracking ROI and, and knowing it. And also, you know, we get 2,000 people to the website. Of those 2,000 people, how many people can we kind of work through this funnel? So then it starts to give you a better idea of we have to drive 20,000 people to the site in order to get, you know, whatever conversion you're looking for. So that would be that would be definitely something that would be able to be done on a more dynamic uh, website. And then with your first question in terms of um, kind of being able to, f to, to, to get into very specific cities, in terms of social, if you're leveraging social media, is that what you're kind of thinking? Sure, particularly through the paid channel, would there be a way to geo-target more outside of Wausau? Yeah, it's it's actually kind of scary how, uh, t t I mean, you can get to very specific neighborhoods if you want to. So that's absolutely uh, on the table, if, but you have to put a little money behind it. But you can target, I mean, you can target specific zip codes, um, neighborhoods sometimes if the city's big enough. Um, cities, uh, like we did, which, you know, those those ones I've mentioned, Chicago and that. That's very doable when you're paying to, to play. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? No, seeing none. Okay, well, I appreciate your, your report and stuff, and, and I look forward to you know moving ahead. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And thank you. Okay, let me get back to my landing page. Um, Item number three, discussion and possible action on approving economic development policies and procedures between City of Wausau and McDevco Incorporated. Uh, Tammy Strats is going to take this for us. Hello. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to introduce uh, the new executive director of McDevco, Kim Weber, here. She's been Hi. with, when did you start? A couple of uh, months, three months? November. Early November, late October, yep. Yep, so um, we've been talking a lot, trying to get her moving and not just get her moving, she's moving miles fast. Um, but with that, we also re had a monitoring from HUD last summer, fallish, um, of our economic development policies and procedures. Um, they've asked a lot of good questions. We provided a lot of documentation along with it was the previous um, policy and 
procedure agreement that was with McDefco. You saw the old one in there. It was dated 2017. And they, HUD, being they, HUD, came up with some ways that they wanted to, us to clean up the policy, make it understanding more of who does what, who's responsible for what, um, who hangs on to the money, what does that mean. There's a lot of citations that we needed to quote, definitely saying that our goal is to meet the low and moderate needs of um, job requirements. So it, this is more of a housekeeping thing. We're not changing how we, we operate together. It's just spelling out who is responsible for what. So after we redid re this, um, and you'll see the highlights on the, up to, up the, the new one of what got changed, I did send it to HUD, and they approved it uh, over the phone. They can't approve it and say that we've met their guidelines until it's signed. Obviously, we can't sign it without you guys um, approving it. So that's what we need, that's what we're doing today, is um, saying these are the changes and um, open for interpretation, I guess. <laughs> Very good. Well, as you say, I mean, it does look like a, a housekeeping, updating kind of thing that doesn't <coughs> fundamentally change mission or processes, but just lays out some refreshed you know, verbiage, that kind of thing. Uh, anything from the uh, committee? Uh, Alder Rasmussen. Thank you. Um, yep, I do like the um, clarity that's been added to the agreement. I think it really delineates whose responsibility is what, and I think that the reporting requirement um, that exists between McDevco and community development is not only key, but it's clarified there mm -hmm. as far as the frequency. Um, I do like the fact that you'll continue to network with one another and that the community development department continues to retain seats on the committees that make these decisions um, to make sure that we're meeting those HUD metrics. So. Um, with that, um, I think that um, this agreement will function well, and if it's compliant with the recommendations, I'll make a motion to approve it. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second to the motion? I have a second from Watson. Anything further on the item? That's Alder Killian. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a few questions about process and how it was done historically between the HUD, the city, and McDevco. So this has been a, a quite a long-term relationship. Is that correct? That's very correct, yes. And so uh, what I was noting, I guess, in some of the documentation, uh, since uh, at least one of these, I believe, is a nonprofit, so the returns were online for public review, uh, the management fees associated with, say, revolving loan management, mm -hmm. Those are coming then from HUD, is that correct? Correct. And those then went to McDevco, the management fees and revenue. So what happens um, is, or how it happened in the past is, and, and being on the Citizens Advisory Committee, you see how the applications come to, come to the committee and there's a request for new funds. Um, and in the past, we had funded McDevco anywhere from 60,000 to 150,000 depending on what kind of loan availabilities were out there, um, what their revolving loan fund in-house is. So we kind of had to, kind of like our homeowner rehab program, we kind of, I don't also hate to say play the game, but try to figure out how much money do we need that we have in our revolving loan fund, how much new money do we need so that we can keep the projects going. And knowing that it's going to take us a year before we get the new money from HUD. So you're constantly trying to play this game. Um, so when we send the money over to them, it, it's because they have a loan. Now, they would get paid on the loan repayment. So as we lend you money, whatever dollar amount, and as you're making payments to them, you're able to take, or they're able to take a maximum of 20% towards administration costs of which 15% McDevco will keep and 5% is in the city's pot in case we need it for any economic development activity. And that's how it works with our homeowner rehab. Any, any type of revolving loan funds, as the loans come back, we're able to keep 20% for administration purposes. Because if you need bodies and you gotta pay them in order to, to get the product out the door. So that, that's how that works. Did I answer your question? 
Uh, yes, that okay. makes sense. Uh, it led to a really a related question because what I saw in years past, and I want to know if this had changed, is that in McDevco's financial documents, uh, it was listing uh, independent contractors that it was paying more than $100,000 during that tax period, and there was ge generally only one, and it was the Wassa Chamber of Commerce, for instance, in this tax period, that was $386,000, where uh, then on the Chamber's uh, tax returns, they were listing almost $400,000 in management fees that year. But you mentioned uh, an agreement in 2013, and I took a look at that, and it was the underwriting agreement, I think, between the city uh, and McDevco, and at the time, Mr. Zarini signed that as CEO of McDevco, but during that tax period I mentioned uh, where McDevco was paying uh, the chamber $386,000 in, in the chamber's tax returns that year, it lists Mr. Zarini as the executive director uh, of the chamber. So I'm a little confused about the dynamics, uh, particularly during the year of this underwriting agreement that the head of McDevco was also the head of the chamber and McDevco was paying the chamber $386,000. Uh, so I guess one I want to know is moving forward, uh, can there be more uh, kind of clarity with this committee and the city on which independent contractors are used, if they are used. Uh, and then uh, based on the situation I just described, uh, based off of tax returns, is that dynamic still occurring or has things changed since then? That has changed quite a while ago. There was a splitting of, there was a partnership at the time that McDevco was housed at the Chamber of Commerce. There was a partnership split and McDevco went out on its own um, as a nonprofit, no longer a part of the chamber. Um, so that's the tax returns you saw was when they were part together. I can't speak about the Jeffs or anything that was, I, I can't. I, I don't know what happened back there then. And I know it used to be that whoever was because of the chamber, the chamber was the parent company, I believe that's why he was the president of the mm -hmm. chamber and also McDevco because of the parent company. I'm guessing just in my head of how I remember, I just remember working with them a little bit. I didn't work with them in this capacity as I, I, as I do now. Yeah. But there was some, they divorced, okay? It wasn't a pleasant divorce, but they split ways. Yep. And I think more clearly, Tammy pointed it out correctly, the Chamber and McDevco were part um, in one. I can't speak to the past. I would be more than happy. Obviously, our records are public. We get a yearly audit through Whitfley, and they have to sign off on all of that. So if we wanted to have further discussion outside of, of these quarters, I would be happy to do that upon getting that information from my accounting team that services us every year, as well as the board that kind of governs us and was part of that, that uh, breakaway. But as far as transparency, everything that we do, as we say at McDevco, is above board. Everything we want to do with this agreement is to make sure that we're streamlining things so that it's accurate for HUD, it's accurate on my books, and that we have the appropriate reporting for Tammy that I have, and we all are in symbiosis. So we also wanted to clean up some of the pieces in here that are going to make us more serviceable for our loan clients. I'm also a McDevco loan client, and I know the work that goes into these documents on our end and on their end, and ensuring that we provide a product similar to what a bank would. You have a loan, loan at a bank. What they ask of you, if you're making your payments and you're creating jobs or maintaining, is going to be truly minimal. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to do is make sure we simplified that um, and had a lot of uniformity across the board. To your point, to be very transparent to those that are asking questions of us and that we're reporting to, essentially. So really good question. A lot of conversation went into this document with those things in mind. Thank you, and that yeah. uh, information is, is comforting given the past and the tax records. And I think given what seems to be an inclination yeah. to improve upon w what happened yeah. a decade ago, uh, could we add, please, a stipulation in these rules that would uh, kind of preemptively uh, prevent uh, those optics of a conflict of interest with independent contractors because uh, what I'm hearing now uh, from the city side on this committee and, and what you just said, which I thought was very positive, is being on the same page that we don't see those uh, 
perceived, you know, whether they're real or perceived, I think that's the key, but we don't see those perceived conflicts moving forward. So uh, could we add a stipulation so that that kind of historical relationship does not manifest again? Uh, first of all, uh, and before you answer, I'm not, and you're welcome to answer, uh, you know, this would uh, probably have to come as the form of a, an amendment to the document before us, which we'd have to vote on, too, if we agreed. So uh, uh, could you want to uh, uh, address Mr. Killian's uh, question first to see, you know, does the existing verbiage that we have uh, fun, you know, fundamentally address his concern, or do you see that there could be a need for such stipulation, as he says, being added? I guess um, I would need some Clarity exactly what what do you want us what verbiage do you want to see on there? What are you looking for? I guess. Sure. If there would be uh, a time frame, we could uh, address this matter with the city attorney in an interim period, uh, based on I guess uh, whatever the language would be uh, that's appropriate in this context. It would be that uh, we would never have uh, the head of McDevco paying three hundred and eighty-six thousand dollars to an organization he's also the head of and the highest-paid employee based on tax returns. So whatever the appropriate okay. uh, most you know brief language would be, I think the city attorney could probably draft that. So it sounds more like what you're asking for is something from McDevco stating that we won't expend X amount of dollars to something. So just to give you a little bit of, of insight here, we can't, I can't. So in our bylaws, I can't write a check, for example, over $2,500 without another signature from my executive committee. So with our auditing team, WIFLI, we have a lot of processes and procedures in place to ensure there's that appropriate check and balance. I don't know that this document is the appropriate place for it since we're talking about McDevco expenditures, um, which we are, I am, heavily governed by a board. So um, we wouldn't hire an independent contractor at McDevco without consent of our executive committee, and then it does go to full board. So not that I don't want to waste anybody's time or bother Ann Jacobs, I just don't think that's something that really has a place within this document based on what we already have in place at McDevco as a separate entity from the city, but as a good extension of one another. Um, I don't see that as an issue. And we also have to remember they are managing other funds besides city funds. Yes. Block grant funds are a small portion of what they manage. Yes. So um, they're, they're answering to many boards, not just us. Yes. They're, an, they're answering to many. And to say that you can't expend X amount of dollars, I don't know if that's fair. Um, we end up seeing their audit every year because we have to make sure that they are spending block grant monies properly. Um, how they spend the rest of their money, it's not up to us to tell them. Um, but right. my, our goal is block grant money, federal funds, we need to make sure that they're spending it accordingly. Yep. Thank okay. you, and I believe HUD has some provisions uh, already at higher level in the chain that I'm sure would address conflict, and uh, yes. thank you for that information. I think just based on kind of the uh, unwillingness or uh, lack of viability of adding that language, I'll be voting no tonight. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, Alder Killian's comment there. Uh, could be uh, presented as a, a, a proposed amendment to the document uh, if he so wished and that we would have to vote on that. And uh, bear in mind that would be an amending a document which has already been uh, pre-approved, if you will, uh, from the federal level. So um, that's where that is. So it, it is uh, his right if he wants to uh, offer an amendment. Uh, uh, Alder Rasmussen. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just say that on this subject, I think that the divorce that occurred between the chamber and McDevco is a good thing. I think it allows McDevco to operate um, with a different level of transparency and a different level of service to its business clients. I mean, I've been here a long time, and I was here when Zerini was in play, and I was here when um, they were still commingled and when the divorce occurred. And I think that, you know, whether it was, you know, him or not, I think there were subsequent chamber directors, and there was at least one prior McDevco director where um, there was just a, a serious lack of meeting of the minds and a totally different value system. So. I think that the fact that they're split now takes care of some of the things that we might have worried about 10 years ago. So I, I feel like that's done. You know, if that marriage doesn't occur again, I think we're over the hump with that. I, I, back, back then, I certainly would have um, agreed with the idea that you'd have some language in these agreements that like separates that relationship because it was difficult to tell when one ended and the other began. 
back then, but I think this it's taken care of now, so I feel like it's we're good. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you, Alder. Anything else from the committee? Seeing none, all in favor of what's before us, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. We have one opposed. Thank you. And I just want to take an opportunity to, uh, to welcome uh, Ms. Weber to our yeah. committee and hope to see you around uh, more. Uh, I'm on the, the, the board of the Entrepreneurial and Education Center and last couple of months you've uh, joined us to give updates from McDevco and whatnot. And I'll just say that the, the board, uh, once you've left the room, have all pretty much said uh, that they just uh, think you're a great addition, a lot of energy and bring a lot to the table. So uh, welcome and I look forward to working with you. Same here and thanks for having me. Thank you. Sure enough. Thanks. Okay, moving on to the one we've all been waiting for, item number four, update on 2022 marketing plan from Director Brodick. Yes, thank you. I know I have been waiting on this one too. This has been a lot of months in the, in the works. Um, so I have a lot that I will kind of talk through. It's mostly outlined in this memo, um, but I just want to, uh, I guess, kind of give the opportunity for everyone to, to understand exactly what we're doing. So um, as some background, uh, this committee last authorized an extension of a contract with the Plum PR for September 1 through February 1 today uh, to allow staff to put together a more comprehensive marketing plan. Um, as you know, I was uh, two weeks into my role at, and on September 1 when we authorized this extension and we knew we were hiring um, our economic development manager, uh, Randy Pfeifferick. So Randy and I have been working extensively since October uh, when he brought, was brought on. Um, and what we're recommending, like I said, is outlined as, uh, um, in this memo in the packet. So in sum, we started with the, with the questions of who is our audience and what is the goal or what are we trying to accomplish with these funds. There are a lot of ways we could have looked at this opportunity and after reflection and research, we realized that our best investment is in terms of, um, in, in terms of what we needed for our community, which is really workforce and uh, money and what we control, what we can control as the city is in retention. So, um, and then this also speaks to repurposing some of the WASM content that Elizabeth pointed out in her presentation because it is really powerful, um, relatable content. So uh, I've been involved with this uh, kind of work for almost a decade and, did co and keep coming back to a study that I found early on uh, when I was starting in this kind of works, which is the Knight Foundation. Uh, back in 2010, they did a three year long nationwide survey of 40,000 people across 26 communities of varying sizes, demographics, and locations about why people live where they live. This, they surveyed uh, what are called drivers of attachment, which are basically the factors that are most influential about why people live and love where they live. The top drivers across all communities were openness, how welcoming people are, aesthetics, how pretty a community is, and social offerings, what there is to do there. And to underscore the timeliness of these findings, the Brookings Institute just published an article last week about the importance of quality of life investments being key to small and mid-sized um, Midwestern city vitality. And the types of investments they suggest are what WASA is great at, but what's most important is that people know about these things. All the amenities mean really nothing if they're not used. Um, and how attached, people, uh, how attached people are to their community in terms of drives economic outcomes like productivity, engagement, well-being, and retention. And it also happens to fall in line with the county's goal of becoming the healthiest, most prosperous county in Wisconsin and the city's emerging strategic goals, which of course yet have to be officially adopted, uh, in which the sense of belonging of the community is underpinned in every priority. So as I mentioned, we've heard from virtually every business owner we've spoken with that workforce is their number one pain point um, as, a, a, as a business. And then we as a department need to do our part in addressing this. Um, but we really can't focus on attracting people unless we can retain who we already have. Um, we think that the best way to address development is an asset-based development, and citizens are our best assets and salespeople in the community, but only if they know everything about what WASA has to offer. So the goal of this program and our investment is to build awareness of everything that we have, both in terms of our amazing citizens and our natural, cultural, and social assets. So basically, we're working on enhancing the perception of openness and, and uh, social offerings in the community. And our department, of course, also works on aesthetics, but that's not quite part of what we're talking about here. Um, so we started with, uh, after we you know, had these questions of kind of who's our audience and what's the goal, we wanted to look at the landscape of who, of what organizations um, are engaged in marketing in WASA. So we met with the CVB, the Chamber, GWPP, and Synergy, 
Um, Kim from McDevco and I also talked a little bit, um, but they're not super involved in marketing. So across all uh, of our conversations, kind of walking the halls of uh, people who are organizations involved with this, we found that most are primarily focused on attracting people from outside the region to the community. And when we discussed our internal marketing plan that we were kind of putting together, like formulating in our heads throughout these conversations, um, they all agreed that this was not their primary focus, that these existing organizations are not primarily focused on internal community to community marketing. Um, and they also said that this was needed a needed investment in our community. So we did research and attended webinars and discussed economic development uh, marketing approaches. And actually at a recent IEDC webinar, or International Economic Development Council, um, it really validated this focus on internal marketing and retention marketing. And it's essentially said, and I'm paraphrasing, that if you're not marketing to your community, your community to your community, you're failing. So um, simultaneously, I had been having these uh, kind of marketing and brainstorming conversations with Tim Parker, the president and CEO of the Community Foundation, and Ryan Gallagher, who's the owner of Rocket Industrial and a local philanthropist with a very strong background and extensive background in marketing and branding. And we basically also agreed that this is something WASA needs. So after these conversations, I went out, uh, like I said, to kind of learn what others were doing because we didn't want to duplicate efforts that would be wasteful, um, and we wanted to be part of something that would work. So um, as we were having these conversations and realizing nobody else is doing this, Ryan, was, Ryan set up a donor-advised fund at the Community Foundation to focus on internal marketing. So as we talked, the goal of uh, better connecting residents to what's already here and thereby increasing resident attachment became very clear. So as city staff, we reviewed our options with these marketing funds. We could have created another RSP, invested in an ongoing effort, hired for a specific project that would um, connect community members, but basically, because we have such this, this really audacious goal of increasing um, resident attachment, we figured out that we really need to find a longer term, more substantial investment. So the, um, by partnering with the Community Foundation, which is what I'm proposing that we do with our marketing funds, we contribute to a fund that is five times of what, uh, what we could afford on our own in three years. So our $20,000 a year investment becomes uh, part of a $360,000 uh, investment over three years. So um, the Community Foundation is really, uh, and specifically Ryan's donor advised fund, is really an ideal partnership for this investment. It's a private nonprofit that really has a better persona than the city uh, or any government entity to head such an initiative aimed at attaching people to their community and is not subject to political whims. It can, and with, because it doesn't have the same level of bureaucracy, it can really react to in, immediate needs uh, a little bit more easily. And moreover, unlike other organizations that are engaged in this type of, uh, or in, in marketing in our community, we have a much broader constituent base. Both the Community Foundation and the city um, are you know, interested in retaining people regardless of employer, industry sector, title. We want people living in Wausau because they are, because, because they are here. <laughs> um, we want all people who are living here loving living here. So basically, we're working on a memorandum of understanding that reflects an agreement between the city of Wausau uh, and the Community Foundation in which the city would invest our uh, $20,000 of our already budgeted marketing um, uh, budget uh, to this donor-advised fund that would then hire someone, uh, a full-time position, focused on enhancing resident attachment in and to Wausau. It is to provide some uh, level of public oversight. It's proposed that I would sit on the um, hiring and advisory committees and potentially Randy would as well, um, so that we, and that this investment would be reviewed annually, uh, potentially by economic development, certainly by the council to, like I said, retain some oversight of this. So the next steps are that we would go through finance as a sole source agreement per the procurement policy, and we plan to take that to finance on the 8th and then council on the 25th. And um, I do have a video, uh, Shannon has a video queued up if we have time because I would love to better explain, I think that uh, the, the video does a, probably a better and definitely more succinct explanation of um, exactly why resident attachment is so important to, uh, to economic output in a community. But um, I guess I just wanted to, and this isn't itemized for uh, any kind of action, but I wanted to ev update everybody as to what we are doing. So, um, yeah, if you would. <laughs> maybe or maybe not. We will get that up. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> While we're waiting for that, I just I, I will kind of you know encourage the, the committee when time is right to to chime in on this to uh, maybe uh, just give some um, initial reactions to the, the overall concept that we're talking about to that might further you know uh, kind of elucidate what we're looking for. Uh, I, I mentioned I'll have a couple more two things to say myself. So, which one did you want? Uh, the five minute, please. I don't, when is um, council scheduled to start? Uh, ostensibly, as, as soon as this one is over, uh, but uh, uh, legally, maybe a, a 6.15. Just want to make sure we're not cutting it. Or is it 6.30? I forget what the... Or when we're done. It's been three years in the making, with the thoughts and opinions of more than 40,000 people. Conducted by Gallup, the most respected polling organization in the world, and in collaboration with the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, a champion of informed and engaged communities, and of advancing journalism in the digital age. All with one single purpose, to understand what makes people love where they live, and why it matters. This is the soul of the community. In early 2008, the Knight Foundation partnered with the Gallup organization to launch the Soul of the Community project. Three years of surveying has revealed surprising and nearly universal findings about why people form lasting emotional connections to where they live and the connection this has to local economic growth. The Knight Soul of the Community project is an attempt to find out how people actually feel about place, about the place where they live, what connects them to place, what makes them live there and not someplace else, what binds them to the place in a way that might engage them in the life of the community. The study, conducted in 26 communities across the U.S. where the Knight Brothers own newspapers, studied the loyalty and passion residents have for the place where they live, their community attachment. Our question was, does it matter if people are attached to the place they live? Might it cause them to engage more? And does their engagement matter? Gallup was exploring this as well. Our interest overlapped. And so we formed this really interesting partnership around this. Gallup found about 20 to 30 years ago that uh, engagement in companies actually uh, is one of the drivers of all the important indicators that leaders have within companies which are uh, worker productivity and uh, stock increase, etc. So what we wanted to test was, is that true all, as well with communities? Um, so would it be true that the more attached people are in their communities, does that drive all the indicators like GDP growth and well-being? The Gallup organization found that there were certain factors or drivers which connect people to their community. So what we have before us are the 10 drivers that seem to matter most and attaching people to place. Of course, different drivers matter more to attaching people to place than others, and that's part of the gift of the survey, to help communities figure out what are the top things that attach people to place. Perception of a community's safety, its leadership, 
and the basic services it provides its residents are among the 10 drivers the study identified that attach residents to a community. But across nearly all the communities studied, there were three major drivers that are most important to creating an emotional bond between a person and their community. The ideas of social offerings, openness, and aesthetics matter a great deal in attaching people to place. Given the diversity of the Knight communities, you know, we have everything from Grand Forks to Miami, to see the same things coming up over and over again and, and again as being the key things that attach people to place, we have to give some special credence to those three things that we're finding. Uh, it's very important to see these poll results because clearly we want to make San Jose and the region be the best it can for diversity of people, for all the vitality that they bring, and make life as good as it can be for everyone. And so for government, this is a way for them to use this as a tool for their allocation of resources and the way that they focus their energies on building a vibrant community. Knowing why people live where they live and what they love about their communities helps leaders understand how to engage them more. The Soul of the Community Study is a powerful tool for leaders to advance transformative change efforts aimed at improving communities. What Soul of the Community brings to the table is that it shows folks that attachment to place and place really does matter in meaningful ways, including local economic growth. And by taking that one step further, by telling people what are the things that most drive attachment, we give communities a very workable roadmap and how to really increase community attachment for their community, potentially to make their community more attractive for residents, but also to recruit the kind of talent that they're interested in seeking and potentially help with their long-term economic growth. Our hope is that by sharing the information, we will inspire all kinds of people. Some may be elected leaders, others are you know, leaders in their neighborhood, um, others are folks who haven't thought of themselves as leaders but see this as an invitation to say, hey, I can organize something, I can help make my hometown better because I want more people to be passionate about it and loyal to it in the same way that I am. To find out more about the Soul of the Community study and its results, visit www.soulofthecommunity.org. To join the discussion on Twitter, use the hashtag SOTC. Hey, good job finding that. <laughs> uh, sure, uh, committee, I'm opening it up now, uh, Alder Rasmussen. Thank you. Um, I actually like this new focus. Um, we, for the last few years that we've been investing in marketing, you know, with varied levels of success, we really have focused on outreach because for years and years we had not focused at all on outreach. So our goal in those early years of at least having a marketing budget in the first place um, was to reach out and make people aware that, you know, of what WASA was and what, you know, what it had to offer. And so having worked on that for a few years now, um, we do have some dividends being paid from that effort. And, you know, as you said, there's other agencies now that are interested in furthering that effort, you know, whether it be the Chamber or the B Visitors Bureau or GWPP or whoever. And I think now for us to shift our focus a little bit to that inreach, to that, um, you know, looking to retain. And, you know, we really are looking to retain um, residents at various levels. The residents we have right now that are that are of working age, um, business owners. We're looking also at retaining or reacquiring our young talent. Um, you know, just yesterday, as an example, the mayor and I hosted 60 high school leadership kids in this room yesterday. They were the most insightful, inspiring group of young people that that I've met in a long time. And so, you know, listening to them and and just their insight and their perspective on all things that is talent that we want back. So if those kids leave WASA to pursue their education, we want to reacquire those people. And we want them to be connected enough to their committee or community that they want to come home and, you know, raise that family or, or you know, send their kids to school or start a business or whatever. And I think our ability to focus on, you know, what we have and not let that resource slip away is key. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, a few years ago, um, this committee was given a homework assignment. We were given a book to read. Um, called For the Love of Cities. And it was a little bit of a dry read, but the message in it um, really was about um, how a sense of place is key and place making is key, um, both to marketing, attracting, and retaining. And, you know, I think that uh, some of those um, 
drivers that were discussed in the video were, were also discussed in that book and really what you can get when people are connected to the place they live. So I love this new focus. I'm excited to see what can be achieved. And I, I really like the idea that we can basically quintuple our investment by partnering with the Community Foundation. I mean, that's huge for us. You know, they, I think we can do it bigger. I think if we were to go it alone with that money, we'd have a diminished result. So I'm, I'm excited. Thank you. Uh, before I go to all your Watson, I just want to sort of add that, you know, this, uh, this information, uh, it really underscores also the, the very uh, reason that this committee, you know, our, our mission as a committee, as part of uh, city council, which is to uh, help create more things within our community that can stand up as models for reasons to stay here or to be attracted here. I mean, not just ideas about how great it is or whatever, but actually making more and more great things happen here. Um, I think that's key to what we're here to do. Um, and I'll just throw into that, you know, um, uh, retention is, is very important, but there's always going to be attrition as well. And I just, uh, going forward, I want to be sure that we have a, a balanced uh, attack uh, to outreach and inreach, as you say, uh, to, you know, how are we going to uh, attack both of those? Because we do need to uh, attract outside people and businesses, entrepreneurs and the like here. And uh, they need to get to know about us and all the really great things that we would be talking about in this marketing. So, uh, uh, Alder uh, Watson. So I also, I mean, I like the, the idea that we're partnering with um, somebody that maybe has a better, um, I guess, forward-facing look, like people will appreciate some of the stuff coming from there. I guess my concern, too, is that we're looping in the other communities, because I think one thing is it's more of a regional um, draw. And I mean, we're, we do leak, even though we're the city of Wausau, we do leak in Rothschild, Schofield, Weston. So I don't know if there's going to be more of a partnership because that would be pretty cool if we could get um, more of the, you know, our neighbors to even ante up and then have more of a regional marketing focus. Yes, I'm happy to speak to that. So I think this is one of the reasons that the Community Foundation is such an ideal entity for us to partner with because they do have, I mean, their reach is all the way up to the UP of Michigan. Um, that, that foundation really has a broad geographic span. What we have talked about, uh, you know, when we, when we use the term community, we have to be aware because, as you said, all economic development is regional. We have to be aware of, we have several people who work in Wausau, live in Mosinee or Schofield or Weston or, you know, Cronenwetter. And, and we have, you know, the, that cross uh, kind of pollination of communities is a reality. And so um, I think that that's kind of, like I said, the beautiful thing about working with the Community Foundation. What we have been talking about um, in, in, you know, in our conversations with Tim and Ryan is setting and having multiple phases to this because, you know, what we're proposing is a three-year investment. So we have the opportunity to do, um, to, to kind of expand what this looks like over the course of the years. So what we want to do in year one is really set a baseline and get some data and some measurables that we can then measure against. And then we've talked about in, you know, phase two, for instance, there's a um, on this IEDC webinar, there was a, a proposal put to, or a program uh, and Gravenhurst Canada put together that was really amazing. And I was just like so enthused about it. And it kind of goes to um, Alder Neil, your point about, uh, um, you know, kind of attracting at the same time as retaining. So I think that we have a lot of opportunity with this multi-year approach and this partnership, um, as Alder Rasmussen, you pointed out as well, to, you know, quintuple our investment uh, with this partnership that we can, you know, we can really expand and do some some great things regionally and talk about, you know, um, the things that would otherwise take two hours to get to in um, any other area of the state is within a half an hour here. And within half an hour is a lot. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not just Wausau. Um, so I think that, you know, being aware of what we, uh, of that, like I said, that cross-pollination is built into this plan. Thank you. Uh, bear in mind now we are five minutes supposedly from the beginning of uh, the council meeting. So, uh, Alder Ryan, I think you were next. Uh, thank you, Tom. I'm not normally on this committee, but I guess I just wanted you to be aware of, um, I think there are a few p people on the council that have been connecting, but nextdoor.com has been in the Wausau area for seven or eight years. And it just seems like every day there are people coming in saying hi. 
this is me, this is our family, this is what we love about the city. And um, going back a number of years, our police chief had said he had no intention of being involved in next door at all. There are some other villages in our area that are involved. And, uh, but one thing, are, if you went and looked, it's being said daily as a way to talk about issues in the community, what's the best, what they like about the community. Just recently, uh, a lady was saying that she's willing to do crochet and other quilting, learned about other alpaca or different wools that are available and that are being um, found in our area. And it's pretty much being said every day on, online by neighbors in the community. Um, I don't have exact numbers for the WASA, but I know it's over 4,500. And if you look at how next door is expanding in our region, it's it's lit up all over, and and I think it's it, it is giving that sense of community that you may not have been aware of, but if you would go in and check it out, you'd see it's happening every day. Thank you. Thank you. Good conduit for uh, you know communication from the city to uh, Alder Killian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll keep it brief. We've got maybe 60 seconds of freestyling here. So, okay. Uh, well, uh, you know, I understand. Thank you. I appreciate the time and initiative you, you took to, uh, to look at this and, and approach it. I think, you know, part of how I feel as a, a marketer is, you know, looking at the marketing mix right now of kind of product, price, promotion, and distribution. I'm not sure if we're at the promotion level yet in, in terms of our own people. I think that the textbook marketing principle tends to be kind of identifying and satisfying needs. So like Alder Neal said, some of the things we do, I think it improves the product. We're hearing from citizens improvements they would like to, to see, you know, transit, housing, uh, issues like that. So I think, you know, part of retention as much as modifying added attitudes or reinforcing them is actually uh, kind of improving upon our, our product. And I think right now that may be a, a central uh, element of how we retain citizens. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Alder Ryan, your light is on. Is that just uh, okay? Very good. Uh, please go ahead. I was just going to say, I just want to make clear that this is not obviously the, the outsourcing and the partnership of these funds does not uh, in any way negate any of the other work that our department does. Uh, this actually frees us up to focus on exactly uh, as Alder Neal and, and you have pointed out, uh, the ability to create, to keep creating a wonderful and even better community for everybody to love and uh, love even more and live in uh, and hopefully you know increase that population. So really excited for this uh, partnership. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Alder Rasmussen. Thank you, I think just one final comment. I think that, and I've said for a long time, um, there's stuff to celebrate in Wausau every single day if people look. And sometimes it takes calling their attention to things that need to be celebrated or observed. And so I think that um, some of this effort really is going to make people aware of things they might not have known before. Yeah. You know, And uh, I, I think that's a big positive for us with, in terms of the perception of the community in the eyes of its residents. All right. Thank you. Uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I have from Watson. I have a second from... Killian. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>